Hey guys, I am Brett Slater. This is The Secret to Money. Today's video is going to be on Jordan Peterson. I found an old interview. Uh, as you can see, he's got more hair. He's not so grey. A little bit of weight. But the message is just as good. He's talking about risk. He's talking about money. He's talking about understanding that risk is everywhere. And if you are unable to deal with risk, then you're unable to have a good financial situation. Let's get straight into it. Like I said, I am Brett Slater. This is a secret to money. There is no secret. There is no secret. Uh, like, subscribe, share if you uh, if you feel that this is going to help you. And uh, enjoy. You're accustomed to keeping things in the fog in general. You're going to keep yourself in the fog with regards to your investments. Because in some sense, everything you do is an investment. Right? I mean, some of it's quantified in monetary terms, but you're always investing in one manner or another. And so I think if your character has been disrupted by your persistent attempts to deceive yourself about the nature of reality, you're going to be a financial train wreck. And I mean, I've certainly seen that in my clinical practice. I've seen people burn through amounts of money that you wouldn't think someone could burn through in that short a period of time because of self-deceptive blindness. If you have a high IQ and you're conscientious, which is another trait, then you're more likely to be financial, financially successful, say, by the time you're in middle age. And so that looks like a temperamental, two temperamental traits whose presence enables you to beat randomness over time. So those, those traits work very well in this society at that, this time, but you can also argue that that's also a matter of chance, because there wouldn't be unconscientious people if at some point in the past, unconscientiousness hadn't aided their survival. So what constitutes beating a system depends on the parameters that you put around the system. And you know, you can think the same thing about, well, look at how successful he is. Okay, you mean financially. All right, so then, well, how's his health? How's his marriage? How are his relationships with his children? What price did he pay for his wealth? You know, like as you, as you add dimensions of evaluation, whether that particular person won or lost might not be so self-evident. Well, they gamble partly because it's fun. You know, like, and I mean that technically. Most of the neurochemicals that your brain produces that are associated with the kind of pleasure that people really like, which is like, for example, the kind of pleasure that drugs like cocaine produce, are produced by um, risky, high risky behavior that has the potential for high return. We like that sort of thing. And people are wired so that they're more responsive to the probability of something good happening than even to the good thing. So, for example, we know that if people win the lottery, a year later they're about the same as they were. No better, no worse. So, actually winning all that money has a limited long-term impact on their happiness. That's probably more determined by their tra trait temperament. But the lead-up to the good event, that's the exciting part. It might happen, it might happen. That's excitement. And that's produced by, like gambling will produce that, especially for some people, because some people are really susceptible to that kind of reward. Everyone's susceptible to it to some degree, and that can be manipulated, and that's what uh, slot machines do. Like slot machines manipulate the human propensity to engage in a certain kind of gambling behavior. And why do people gamble? Sometimes taking a risk really pays off. And not taking a risk is also a risk. So there's no way out of risk. It's a gamble one way or another. Just like a lottery ticket winner. You know, what are they paying for? They're paying for the fun that's associated with the anticipation of the reward. And the brain, you know, your your emotional brain isn't that great at calculating mathematical probabilities. And so it sort of says, some chance, you have some chance of winning $50 million. Well, it might be one in 380 million, but your, you know, your anticipation system isn't a mathematical system. It just says, well, you have some chance. That's a lot more than none. Well, in, in some ways, it's infinitely more than none. Because at zero, you have no chance. And, you know, with one ticket, you have some chance. So that gets the old excitement going. You can say a life without risk is hardly worth having. You know, it might be secure, although it isn't, because as I said, not taking a risk also constitutes a risk. 
And you know, when you look back, people often are more um, upset about the things they didn't do, the chances they didn't take, than the failures that they encountered. Now, not always, obviously, it depends on the failure. But, you know, you can sit at home encased in styrofoam and have your meals delivered. And you're probably, you know, you're not going to get mugged, probably. But what's a hell of a life? Men are more aggressive. Men have more testosterone than women. And men are more aggressive than women. And along with that aggression comes a greater propensity to take risks. And so you see this, the best example of that, really the best example is, and the best proof of it is the fact that there are way more male criminals than female criminals. Like, way more. And usually if you get a female criminal, you know, she's tangled up with some guy that dragged her along. I mean, not always, obviously, but it's like 10 to 1. So, yeah, men take more risks. There are more great successes among men and more catastrophic failures. And, and that's the case in most of the like sexually active animal kingdom. Men are relatively more expendable. So here's an example. More than twice as many of your ancestors are female than male. Because on average, almost every woman has one child. Whereas many, many men have none, and some have a lot, like really a lot. I think they estimate that Genghis Khan's genes are present in something like 30% of the Asian population. So there's massive mating success differential among men. And that also inclines them to take risks, because you can be fantastically successful genetically as a male, although you can fail absolutely, whereas with a, a woman can be moderately successful. So, you know, people have tried to define what constitutes optimal health or optimal performance in a system or a person in a bunch of different ways. You can say, well, deviation from the average is pathological, but we don't think about that with talent or beauty or intelligence. So, as a general principle, that can't be right. Um, some people have said for mental health that a system is unhealthy when it deviates from its evolutionary function. Well, I don't buy that because it's very difficult to specify the evolutionary function of all sorts of things. So that just doesn't solve the problem for me. What seems to happen, as far as I can tell, is that things are useful up to a certain point, and once they dominate, and sort of like the Cyclops image, with the Cyclops only seeing one thing, if you get too single-minded about anything, any virtue, or any behavior for that matter, it hits a point where it starts to turn back on itself, and then you've gone too far. And when it turns back on itself, it hits a, what's technically called a positive feedback loop, and then the thing spirals out of control catastrophically and unpredictably. And I can give you some examples of that. So let's say you start to get depressed. Okay, and you know, maybe you're slowly getting more and more depressed. Well, there's going to be a tipping point, or there often is a tipping point, where you're so depressed, you quit going to work, and you lose your job. Well, that's not so good for your depression. Because now you're not only depressed, you're unemployed, and you don't have any money. Well, and then maybe, you know, your wife is getting pretty tired of having to deal with you because you're depressed, and now you also don't have a job, and the stress is too much for her, and so you fight a lot, and that makes you more depressed. And Then you start to stay at home, because you don't really want to show your face in public, so you lose all your friends, and man, it's a cliff. So you're, you're doing not too bad, even though it might be a downhill walk, until you hit this, like, single event, and then it just goes, whomp. You know, because being unemployed makes you more depressed and that makes it more less likely that you're going to look for a job. And you can, okay, with alcoholism, what seems, and other forms of addiction, what seems to happen to me is that you hit the positive feedback loop point when you start using the drug to cure its own withdrawal symptoms. So you're not in trouble with cocaine until you start using it because the cocaine has made you feel bad in the withdrawal. Same with alcohol. You're all shaky and you got the shakes and so on, and you figure out one day, Jesus, shot of vodka, I'm good. Yeah, no, you're firmly in the grip of the devil in that, at that point. And I think a lot of systems are like this. They work fine, but, but as they get more and more exaggerated, they get closer and closer to a tip-off point, and then the tip-off point is where all hell breaks loose. And virtues are even like that. So we know, for example, that conscientiousness is a trait, and conscientious people are industrious, and orderly. So it's like the Protestant work ethic. Okay, 
We also know that orderliness is grounded in disgust sensitivity. Okay? We know that orderly people, on average, have better hygienic habits, and they live longer. But they're also more uh, inclined to radically disapprove of homosexual behavior. They're also more anti-foreigner, because they have a real tight me not me discrimination system and they're disgusted by what's not me well that's good you don't like dirt and you can be sure that among our forefathers it was very frequent if you were an explorer and you went out to meet a bunch of strangers you and your whole damn crew were dead three weeks later because they gave you some disease you have no resistance to whatsoever and it just wiped you out i mean that's what happened to the native americans and it wiped out 95 percent of them you know it's it, this is a deadly thing Anyways, as orderliness increases in its intensity, it starts to shade into like vicious intolerance. So the fascists, for example, the Nazis were orderly. They didn't like parasites. And they thought of anything that wasn't just like them, their corporate body, the Aryans, was a parasite and it should be eradicated. That's a pretty good idea when you're eradicating parasites. I mean, Hitler tried to get rid of tuberculosis to begin with. But then the question arises. What's a parasite? At some point, it's like everyone who isn't me. And, you know, Hitler got to that point before he died because he felt that the whole German society, the, he lost faith in the Aryan society as the war was being lost. And he was perfectly happy that the bloody place went up in fire, which is a purifying element. So, you know, even, look, conscientiousness is virtuous. But you take any virtue too far, off the cliff you fall. So... So there's, there's like this range within which something works. And when you push it past that range, it starts to feed on itself and it turns into some variant of hell. So enthusiasm can easily get out of control. That's what happens when a party gets out of control. That's what happens. Enthusiasm makes people impulsive. It makes them discount the future because today is so great. Enthusiasm turns into mania. And so, you know, everybody says, well, you should be happy. You should be feeling positive affect all the time. It's like, no, wrong. Positive affect is dangerous. You're always telling your kids to stop being so happy. You don't notice it, but they're running around causing trouble. They're having a wild time. They're throwing their arms in the air and they're laughing and they're running around. They're having fun. You say, hey, quiet down. And if you count your disciplinary actions, you'd be shocked at how often what you're doing is telling your children to stop having so much fun. It's disruptive. And you know what happens too, if you let your kids have fun out of control, sooner or later one of them bangs their head on a table or falls down the stairs or gives another kid a poke or, you know, like it will or break something or, you know, it, it isn't just that it bothers people, it's that it's the Dionysian, it's Dionysian danger. It's orgiastic danger. You get too enthusiastic about things, you get to trouble. It's not negative emotion that drives teenage pregnancy. It's impulsive positive emotion, right? The problem is, and this, is, this actually speaks to what people are like, uh, benefit is finite and risk is infinite. You can die. You can only be so happy. You know, like, you can be really happy. Yeah, yeah. You can be, like, just 100% dead. And you're actually kind of wired that way because people are more sensitive to negative events than to positive events. So a loss will hurt you more than a gain of the same magnitude will please you. So that, the reason I'm saying that is because it shows you that we're actually set up for a risky world. Our nervous systems are tuned to be more sensitive to negative information because the world's so damn risky. Now, we'd be completely hiding like a nocturnal animal, except that, you know, we figured out ways to make risk valuable. So we, we're ambivalent creatures, you know. We, we're thrilled by opportunity and terrified by it at the same time, which is exactly what, how it should be. Risk is everywhere. That's the first truth of Buddhism, right? Suffering is inevitable. Life is suffering. Same thing. Risk is everywhere. Life is suffering. Period. So, you know, partly when you're saying, well, can you regulate the collapse of these macro systems? You're saying, well, can you eliminate risk? Well, no, you can't. I don't think. In fact, you could argue, I shouldn't say that exactly. I think there is one way that you can minimize risk. 
don't be crooked. The less crooked your society is, the more you mitigate risk, but you can't eliminate it.